In 2015, it became a crisis. Over a million people went through the Aegean Islands to escape wars, crimes, all sorts of things. Um, and 800,000 of those migrants went through the Lake Island of Lesbos. In October of that year, 200,000 people came through Lesbos. Clearly, a small island like that was hard hit by this huge amount of people coming through the island, and the economy of Greece never could really sustain that kind of influx of people, but they did it. So much so that the island of Lesbos were nominated for the Nobel Peace Prize in 2016. They didn't get it, but they were nominated. In September of 2015, this picture of Elon Kurdi, a, a Syrian toddler, made what a viral around the world, um, bringing the reality of this crisis to the world, specifically what was built because of the Syrian civil war. So many Syrians were trying to escape. In response to that, um, a group of, in response to Elon's picture, a group of Dutch friends, businessmen, um, entrepreneurs, a couple of artists, one of them a celebrity in Holland, used to vacation together. And instead of going to a pizza, they went to Lesbos to see what was going on. And the very first night there, they were, had rented an apartment in Molibos, which is the, the, in the north of Lesbos. And they were sitting having a beer in the evening, and they looked down into the port and two boats came into the port. So they just went down and there was already a woman there helping the folks get off the boats. And these Dutch friends just looked at her and said, what can we do? And they just went to work. So this group of probably six or seven people brought these ref brought refugees out to a little field above the town and just took care of them all night long, feeding them, getting them dry clothes, getting, giving them some comfort. And the next morning, the Dutch friends looked at each other and they said, clearly, we're gonna do something about this. And being with um, people with influence, friends and money, they went back to Holland and they found the largest food truck they could find for sale on the internet, filled it and got it back to Lesbos. And they set it up in a um, parking lot of the largest nightclub on the island, which was just outside the town of Malibos. The owner of the nightclub was allowing humanitarian groups to set up in the um, parking lot to help take care of the people because buses would come and bring them down to Middleene to the registration area, but a lot of them, there weren't enough buses to take care of all of these people, especially the 10,000 people in two days arriving on the island. So they would walk, they would walk. When I used to drive there, it would take about an hour, so I could get the mileage was. And um, so moving on the ground started feeding people. And one day, one of the founding directors of the deal, um, he's still the director of Moving on the Ground. He came upon a group of women who were um, distributing things to people. And to keep the crowds kind of at bay, one of the women was on top of their um, truck just dancing. And the deal thought, that's a really cool chick. Well, they're now together and they have three children <laughs> who, who are being brought up between Lesbos and Amsterdam, literally. And Stephanie, the deal's partner, had done a similar thing. She and a group of Dutch women friends went over to Lesbos at around the same time after Alien's picture went viral. And they went to Lesbos to see what was going on in this island in, in Greece. And what they saw as women was when all the women, women were coming off the boats with their babies and with their children, they had nothing for their, for their families. So these Dutch women started collecting and distributing things that moms need because Carrie was born. So then we 
both organizations work together quite a bit. Again, this Greek island was in no way prepared for this influx of humanity to come through. So um, the, I told you that people had to go to the reception area, which meant they had to sign up for asylum, sign up for the asylum process. And the Greek government decided to do it in an old abandoned prison in a town called Moria. Moria was meant to hold, hold 3,000 people. So clearly, they quickly outgrew Moria. Um, and another area was built up called Karatek, another camp was built specifically for the Syrians coming, because that was the major group coming at that time. But then somehow somebody decided, no, Karatek is going to become the area, the camp for the most vulnerable. Never, and that was built for about 1,400 people. Never figured out how those people that ended up with Karateka as opposed to Moria drew the lucky straw. Because Doctors Without Borders at one point said that Moria was probably the worst refugee camp they had ever seen. And Karateka was the worst, was the best. And so they were only five miles apart. So Karateka was the lucky straw for those people. Um, because we carry a movement on the ground had established a pretty solid positive reputation quickly with what they were doing. So they were invited to come into Karateke and work. And the mayor of Mogolini asked a retired military officer if he would come and be the director of Karateke, Stavros, <coughs> if you know where to say his last name. He, he eventually, everybody eventually on, the, on Karateke would call him the year, which is Arabic for leader. So the residents of Karateke lovingly, respectfully, and fearfully <laughs> called Stavros Mudir because he was strong, and he was tough, but he was so kind. And when he was first interviewed, when he took this job, he, he, his philosophy was that Karatepe is not a camp. It's a village where the spirit of love dominates. We don't want people to think of themselves as refugees. This is a village, and everyone here is part of the community. And he, he worked pretty hard, and it, wor it worked most of the time that way. So I, my first visit to Karatepe, to Lesbos, was in 2017. And at the, around the same time I found this lovely book group here at Norwell, I found a writer's group in my hometown library of Milton. And I'd like to read an essay I wrote for that, um, for my writing group. I, like much of the world, was saddened and horrified when a picture of Aylan Curry, a beautiful Syrian toddler washed up on a Turkish beach, went viral in September of 2015. At that exact moment, one of my own life's toughest odysseys began, but Aylan's picture haunted me. Finally, in the summer of 2017, I landed on the island of Lesbos to volunteer in a refugee camp with movement on the ground. I approached the gates of Karateke for the first time, filled with just a little trepidation. I wondered what could I bring to this table. Well, I quickly learned that my compassion, empathy, energy, and work ethic would go a long way. It was an experience that fulfilled and put my life in perspective like nothing ever could. Karateke, meaning friendly hill, lived amongst Greek Ottoman ruins glass columns, finely chiseled marble wall blocks, literally an archaeological site amongst olive trees overlooking the beautiful Aegean Sea. A huge yurt was the center of Karatepe, functioning as the community center, a three-tiered concrete amphitheater, lovingly decorated with hand-painted images and many colorful prayer flags hanging from the ceiling. Its roof and three sides were similar to easily recognizable UNHCR relief tents. The front consisted of a series of doors that had been thrown wide open to full community events. While movement's scope of work changed over the years I went, Wednesday evenings were sacrosanct, ladies' night. The ladies of the village 
those would come to the yurt for two hours to simply be together, dance, and let their hair down liberally, often handing their babies to anyone who would take them. My first ladies' night, I simply watched in awe, feeling like I was chaperoning a high school dance again. As I looked across the yurt, a lady was holding up a scarf, and out from behind came a young mom, transformed from an abaya hijab wearing Mormon to a half chalk miniskirt and seven months pregnant dancing queen. Residents of Karatepe were from many countries of the Middle East and Africa, so for cultural reasons, no males over the age of five were allowed to give ladies night. Thus, we became bouncers, enjoying youngsters throwing rocks and having temper tantrums in more than one language. In the winter of 2018, one of our international teammates was a Finnish belly dancer. On a bone-chillingly raw night, I was mesmerized as she gave the dance clinic, changed, and looking radiant in her gorgeous costume, danced for us, taking my breath away and knocking some snobbery out of me forever. Truth be told, I didn't go to every ladies' night. I was simply too exhausted. But on a balmy spring evening, while simply bouncing, a young Afghan lady came out, obviously sad. She sat next to me, took my hand, and we chatted a little bit as best we could. I just looked at her and I asked, do you need a hug? And sometimes that's all that's really necessary. Not part of my little essay, but every time I hear Taylor Swift's Shake It Up, Shake It Off, or Ed Sheeran's Shape of You, I'm right back in that yard dancing with everybody. So in that first summer of 17, most of what we did at that time was, um, was it, was, what am I trying to say? Was basically entertainment, keeping people busy in a positive way. Um, we had the dances, a lot of music. Uh, we had a Friday night community dance where everybody came and danced. And um, so all sorts of music from every different country was played and that's where I learned how to do the Dhaka and um, Arabic line dance. Uh, we had Cookies and Conversation. We as an organization couldn't teach because we didn't have a teaching license, but we would gather with adults in the yard and the um, common language, the universal language of Karatepe was English. So we would work with people to try to teach them some English. We had Giving Cafe. From the um, food truck, we would prepare some nutritious snacks a few times a week and just share them with our residents. And um, lots, again, back to a lot of music, a very famous uh, a guest, a famous Dutch group came in to entertain one and they both song with the children one afternoon and then perform the song as the closing night, as the closing song for the night. And two ballet dancers came for a three-day dance clinic, a young man and a young woman. And it was a dance clinic for the children, but everybody was welcome to come and join. And as I was sitting on the second day with the little princess in my lap, this young African lad showed up, Chino, and we always had to be on our toes when Chino came up because he was obviously traumatized. Everybody there was traumatized and he was very volatile. He was 12 or 13 ish at the time. But he came in and he watched and then he left. And a little while later he came back and he sat down and patiently waited for his turn because after there was the group dance lesson, the dancers would take children up one by one to dance with. And so Chino waited his turn, and the young Dutch dancer, who was very tall and very blonde and very lanky, invited Chino up to dance. And it was then that I realized that Chino had gone home and changed. And he had on the exact same outfit as the dancer, black shorts and a white shirt. And the sun was setting, you know, so the lighting was beautiful in the yard, the music, and watching these two young people dance. It was beautiful. There were so many moments like that where you would forget that we were at a refugee camp. 
You could never forget that you were under the guidelines because it was hard. <laughs> um, but it, it, it was pretty beautiful. And so I left, when I left that first time, oh, let me back up. So we worked six days a week with Sundays off. And on my last Sunday, I was invited by what I call the director of operations. He was another red, um, volunteer from Holland who came and basically never left. He, was, he had sold two businesses, one of which was a solo company. So um, he came and he's still a on the farm working to this day. And I called him Gentle Giant because he was huge. And he was basically our boss. And so he invited myself and a French grad student and another Dutch woman who became the football coach for about a year on Caritech at Ellen Lesbos um, to go for a tour of the north. So we went to the beach. Again, up Mollybos was in the north of the island. And there was a beach up right outside Mollybos that was a, a secluded cove. And so that's where most of the boats would come into. Car, people would drive their cars up to the cliffs and shine their headlights out, which would guide the boats. And um, then the, the government, it's a tourist island. island. Remember, the Greek guidelines, their main mode of economics is tourism. So they weren't going to let the, the trash of um, the refugees land and stay on the beaches so that it was brought to the island's dump, which was also right outside the town of Molibos. So after the beach, Gentle Giant took us here and um, mountains of life jackets and boats. And I went there often when I was on the West Coast. And every time I went, it just took my breath away. It took everybody's breath away because every single person that we had met and gotten to know had arrived on these. And um, for me personally, my family spent 20 years whitewater rafting in Maine. So these were instruments of joy for us. And these were instruments of life saving for thousands and thousands of people. But as we looked closer at the life jackets, many of them were made with rugs and styrofoam. So they really weren't made to save lives. They were just made as another way for the smugglers to make more money. Um, so that was, it was pretty emotional, obviously. When I left Lesbos that first time, I noticed right across from the airport, there was this beautiful little chapel right on the sea. So that became my place, the last place I would go every time I left Lesbos, just to say my thanks and my prayers and hope for all the people that I met over the, during my time in Lesbos. And once wasn't enough, so I went back in January 2018. And I, I'd like to read you another essay I wrote. I entered my first writing contest this winter, the Irma Von Beck Writing Contest in honor of my aunt, <laughs> who was frustrated Irma Von Beck. So I entered this and I said, when I arrived back to Lesbos in 2018 in January, it was with pleasure that I found community kitchens, sun and moon were open and being directed with our help by resident refugee volunteers. Yes, I agree. Pleasure sounds strange in regards to a refugee campus. One large issue was, was which kitchen folks wanted to use. Moon Kitchen was nestled right in the housing area. Sun Kitchen was on the edge, probably 200 feet away. It never ceased to amaze me that these folks haven't tra traveled untold miles, usually by foot, to get to Turkey, and then get in a boat to travel seven, seven miles to a, an island in the middle of the sea, would find a few extra feet walking to a kitchen a hardship. But they did, and they fought over it. Humans can be funny. On an early Saturday evening, I was overseeing the boat kitchens while my other international volunteers were entertaining children's cinema. Sun Kitchen was nice and quiet, 
and smelling delicious. So I meandered over to Moon Kitchen, where I fell upon a full house and a screaming match. The two resident volunteers who were working the kitchen shift looked at me and said they had family emergencies and had to leave. Bye. At which point, I had many folks screaming at me in many different languages, none of which I spoke. You haven't lived until you have two, until you felt two people calmly come up to you and say, I want to help you, what can I do? I looked over my right shoulder into the eyes of a lad who had been one of those in my face the summer before, shouting to get into ladies night while throwing rocks. I quickly asked him to go get the next people on the waiting list as few stoves were available. The other kind man simply, on the, simply stood by my side, counting folks down. Within 10 minutes, all was quiet. Folks were smiling and cooking and simply eating them. It smelled wonderful. I took my lemon and lavender oils out of my pocket and got some behind everybody's ears. So those kitchens look beautiful, and they broke down constantly. There were sixteen. There were two kitchens, as I said. There were sixteen units in each kitchen, um, with two burners, two huge refrigerators on either end that we could never run because we couldn't generate enough power, and um, we had to clean them constantly with cold water. So. But they were really, they were wonderful because the kitchen is the center of every household, right? So I went back again in May of 2018 for three months this time. And um, each time I went, the scope of work for movement on the ground changed. So between February and um, May, we had also taken on the clothing distribution for Karateke. We ran a clothing shop, which meant we had to organize and sort and bring stuff in from the warehouses. There were some really crazy buildings that were just thrown up on Karateke. And um, somebody donated the warehouse in Italini, and then somebody donated a huge barn on an old the end of the chicken farm. But there were still goats. So a few times while we were in the, at the chicken farm organizing and trying to find good clothes to bring to the clothing shop, the goats would come and try to work with us. <laughs> um, also what happened that winter is the numbers on Moria just kept growing. So a lot of people were leaving the confines of the Moria camp and started camping outside the camp in all the boroughs. Which meant islanders, by now islanders are getting, starting to get frustrated and fed up. And, um, but movement on the ground decided to go, Jeff the Giant went and set up um, the camp so that it was a little bit kinder and gentler. But the olive grove kept growing and growing and growing. One of the best things that we did, now that we had a camp, now that we had kitchens, is every Monday night, the team from Movement on the Ground would get together. The international team and the refugee team would get together and we'd have a community dinner. We'd cook and play music and eat together. And at that point, I'd like to read one more essay because it kind of describes um, some of the truths really special guys, I've called it My Two Afghans. And I wrote it and put it on my blog after in August of 2021, when he pulled out so illustriously from Afghanistan. On my first day in Karateke that summer of 2017, a young guy walked by me and another international volunteer, a photographer from New York City, actually. While we were serving at the Giving Cafe, he greeted us with a soft hello and a beautiful smile. My photographer friend said, wait till you see him Friday night. Well, my first community dance was indeed a treat. In walked the handsome lad dressed to the nines. Farrah started dancing with another, the 
palpable joy on their faces as they swayed and moved to the music whose beauty to pull. At that first community dance, I was also introduced to Papool. He was in a group of men doing a fascinating type of folk dance with sticks, which I believe is called Chibazi. Those two different forms of dance and the guys doing them describes their different personalities very well. They were roommates, friends, living alone on Karatepe and lived in one of the icebox's with single guys. When I came back from my second visit from January of 18 to Karatepe, I got to know them as we worked together in the community kitchens. Pahul, in fact, was the community leader of the kitchens. I was delighted for him because I had noticed he had a bit of a bad boy in him. But thankfully, his leadership skills had shown through. By the time I arrived for my third visit in May of 18, we were friendly and respected co-workers. This is when Eve chilled up and shared some of his story with me. Farah had left Afghanistan with his mom and younger brother. However, he got left behind when his family was given permission to move forward to Germany because he was over 18. When I met him, he was 21. Many young folks stayed 17 for as long as they possibly could. <laughs> because when traveling with their families and turned 18, they were considered adults and most often left behind while the rest of the family moved forward. That was excruciating to watch. After having worked together for the special evenings of Ramadan in that spring of 18, I arrived to Moon Kitchen one afternoon to share a shift with Farah. He told stories of the wonderful celebratory meals of Eve with his family and his descriptions and pictures from his, cell, from his cell phone of the delicacies and sweets filled the space with the same joy it showed the first time I saw him dance the year before. On that third visit, my very first weekend, I, was spent, I spent working overtime as the community volunteers were flaking on their shifts to the kitchen. As I was working in the kitchen on Sunday afternoon covering for the pool, he walked in looking a tad sheepish. Hello, Mom, welcome back, says he. Me, where the hell have you been, sir? And then we hugged. Pahul then simply quit everything. With time, I learned that Pahul had left Afghanistan with his sister, and she had made her way to Germany. Their mom was still home in Afghanistan. He was in his mid-20s. One day, I went to the cantina to grab some lunch, and Pahul was there. I sat next to him while my food was being prepared. You could never be in a rush there. I looked up and he was looking at me with his big brown eyes. Mom, I'm so bored. Oh, Bahul, I get it. I wish I had an actual blonde bird in my hair. I will share with you though that when I've gone through tough personal times, staying busy has helped me. You have a true gift for languages. We really could use your help and the clothing shop translate. After that, he helped out almost every day for a shift or two in the clothing shop, often showing up exactly when we needed him the most. One evening, there was a lovely community concert that was given to us by residents of Karatepe, Moria, and Islanders, Native Islanders of Lesbos. And the whole came up to me and started swinging me around and dance. I realized he had been drinking, and so I looked at him and I said, you goof, be careful and behave because you know who dare. See, you're getting crazy, you're gonna be in trouble. Okay, mama, I'll be good. This wonderful guy swung me and danced many times. My favorite was when he swung me around the food prep table while we were getting ready for Ramadan. After finishing a long hot shift in the clothing shop, a whole, a great Chilean lady and I got the sillies. Chilean lady and I started simply playing dress up with ridiculous clothes hanging on the walls as decoration. They were ridiculous because they were evening clothes donated to a refugee camp. But they were colorful and pretty, so they brightened up the shop. It was wonderful to be sharing the simple joy, laughter, and the look of astonishment on the whole face when the Chilean lady let her hair down. Farrah walked in. 
quite dejected. It sobered us up very quickly. Each month, after getting another rejection stamp at Moria, Barrow would go into a slump. He had dropped his phone in the kitchen, it had shattered, and he was totally fed up. Mom and he jumped into play, and I offered to take him into Mitalini the next day to get it fixed with the help of the Hool's translation. The phone ended up being a relatively simple fix, thankfully. I was hungry, so we went and ate. For that, poor gentle giant Ted reprimanded me yet again. Finally, his request of, please, Kathy, we need you to leave with your head and not your heart, stuck. Shoes were a nightmare on Caritat Day that summer of 18. After a large supply was finally donated, there was a break-in in the shoe warehouse in the middle of the night. And Jerry issued an edict to deal with it quickly. A fool came to the clothing shop the next day quite upset. <coughs> he had been questioned. I simply said, look me in the eyes, and tell me if you were involved. No, Mom, I promise I was not involved. Okay, I'll speak to Jen Turner. I did. He was eventually told that the pool was in the clear at this time. That summer of 2018, I got to see both of these special guides leave Lesbos. True to the natures, their journeys were different and not always pretty or safe. Through social media, I was able to watch my two Afghans eventually make their way to Germany. Mrs. Fowler, I changed everybody's name when I talked about them. But that's Fowler, the fool wasn't in that picture. But, um, yeah, amazing friendships made over there. Once again, I went back in the spring of two, February of 2019 for three more months. And um, once again, patience was wearing really thin by the native people of Lesbos. So many of us, many of the human, humanitarian groups were trying to include islanders as much as we could. There were many soccer, football, um, tournaments, with the children of the island and refugees. Um, for Easter that year, a group of us made Easter baskets, Easter bags that we gave to the mayor of Moria um, to distribute to his townsfolk, some of his townsfolk. And we started doing more and more in Moria, not just building up and making the olive grove kinder to live in, but we um, would go in and play with unaccompanied children. There were two different sections that we worked in. The section for young guys, probably ages 15 to 20-ish, and um, the one that really hit hard was the younger unaccompanied minors. I mean, the first time I went in, there was a little three-year-old girl who was the boss, and she was beautiful. And she got her own way doing whatever she wanted with everybody but me. So she didn't love me a whole lot until I brought her presents from the dog store. Um, and yeah, it just, I could probably say go on and on. My final time so far on Lesbos was I went over February of 2020. At that time, when I left the United States, we were being told there was a funny Chinese flu going around, but not to worry about it. So I went. Um, and when I went, sorry, Mom, I knew there was a lot of unrest on the island. Um, the islanders had had it. And similar to what's going on with the um, camp, the college demonstrations here, outside instigators were coming in and just stirring up the pot really badly. But also at that time, there were 20,000 people in Moria. And so those folks were really getting fed up. And they also started protesting. And when they protested, the government brought 
government brought over extra military who started shooting tear gas. So Lesbos was a little bit unsettled in 2020, and then a virus hit the world. So I only ended up being there two weeks at that time. But in those two weeks, I got to know my landlord very well because we were sent home a lot. And they took really good care of me. I mean, I got grounded more than once by his son to go to my room and not come out because there was, there was a lot of unrest. And that's where I, um, we experienced our first pushback, which the Greek government still denies, but it still happens very frequently where the Greek Coast Guard will grab boats and push them back into Turkish waters. So as you can imagine, there's a lot of accidents and a lot of um, deaths. The Aegean Sea has become pretty much a pretty large grave site as well. Um, so I came home after two weeks, and when the world shut down, and since 2012, since I left, uh, Moria burned to the ground in September of 2020 in the middle of COVID. People, so at that time there were about 13,000 people in Moria, so they were living on the streets. And the Greek government quickly, hastily put together a temporary camp, which is still being used on an old military site. Paratepe was closed in April of 2021, the kind of camp, and those folks were moved into the temporary camp of Moria. And now the numbers are rising again, and the numbers, the folks coming include Palestinians. I met a lot of heroes, refugees, international volunteers, Stavros, the manager, founded members of Movement on the Ground. But I met one lady in the summer of 2018 who was both a refugee and a humanitarian aid worker. Sarah Mardini, um, I embarrassed both of us the second. I met her at a soccer game, and then a group of us were out on a Saturday night. And somebody said something, and it clicked, and I looked at her, and I said, I know you. You're that girl. You and your sister saved your boat. And so she got embarrassed. I embarrassed myself. But indeed, in 2015, she and her sister had left Syria. And their boat started to sink. And she and her sister were swimmers. Their father was their coach, and he was gearing them up for the Olympics. They were sent ahead of their family, because what happened a lot is people would send their children ahead and then reunification that would get their families even quicker. So Sarah and her sister swam their boat to safety to Lesbos. Her sister has fallen to Olympics on the refugee team. Sarah injured herself in that rescue. So her family finally made it to Germany and Sarah just decided that she wanted to go back to Lesbos and become a humanitarian aid worker. She's got another long piece to her story, but you can watch her story on Netflix. It's a movie called The Swimmers. And it's pretty true to her story. Um, and I'll end there. I could clearly go on and on and on. Thank you. And I'll try to answer any questions you may have. Yes. Oh, boy. I, I found this lovely library and book group in January because um, a book was being, and I, remind me the name again? Um, you can cross the bridge and it trembled. They crossed a bridge and it trembled. It was a Northwestern professor who was a Middle Eastern specialist, and she interviewed a bunch of Syrian refugees and wrote a book, so that obviously caught my interest. And I came to my first group group there, and these ladies kindly let me pretty much take over the group because when we went around the table to talk about 
you know, what, why, how we write the book, I started to say why. And I got asked a lot of questions, including from Zoe, would I come and speak? So this is my first time doing this, so thank you. Enough. Yes, ma'am. Why did Maria Borea burn? Was it arson? Don't know. Um, it's thought that maybe some of the refugees set it on fire. So what would happen is, um, folks on both camps, I can, I can speak best for Karatepe, but um, folks were provided three meals a day. I think by UNHCR, but don't quote me. And they didn't love it, it wasn't great. But at least in Karatepe, when the kitchen's open, they could re doctor the food to how they liked it. And we were right on the sea. A lot of folks could go fishing and then bring the fish and cook it. Moria, feeding the folks on Moria was a nightmare. There were so many people. They had to set up these Congo lines to get them fed. Um, and consequently, when I went back in 2020 and I saw that there were 20,000 people there, people had set up shops, they were baking bread, they were cooking food on outside campfires that clearly weren't safe. So I, the answer to who and how Lori burned, I don't think we'll ever be answered. Did anyone die? Not in that fire, but there were a couple of other small fires. Right after I left in 2020, there was a smaller fire in Moria, and a young girl died. But back to the pushbacks, a year ago, a year ago in June, there was a pushback um, off the coast, not up by Lesbos, but it was further south. Um, 600 people died in that pushback. There have been hundreds of refugees, and I just read today that they're finding they're finding bodies on different beaches, washing up all the time. So, yes. What were some of the things you actually did yourself to help? You? People ask me that all the time. First of all, when I first started going over there, friends and family and acquaintances would say, "But the refugee crisis." Isn't that over? Well, no, never ended. <laughs> and what did we do? Um, like I said, you, I, personally, I would um, manage the kitchens. Basically, we had to act as Switzerland. Because you did, you had all different countries and, and um, traditions and cultures. And so there were fights. And there were you know, you let the Arabs in and you let the Afghans in and you won't let me in because I'm Syrian. And I'm like, I don't know what you are. Our volunteer, the refugee volunteers, I think maybe they did give special preference to some of their countrymen, but we didn't know. And so we would kind of monitor that. We would play the games with the kids. So it sounds mundane what we did. The clothing shop could be a nightmare. So families had a shop by appointment, one family at a time for an hour. And they, each person was allowed certain amount of things. And we had to tally that, and keep track of it in an old computer, and we had to make those appointments twice a week. So there was a lot of that logistical stuff, and then organizing the um, warehouses could be a never-ending full-time job. So we would do that. And um, so it sounds mundane what we did. So my my answer to friends when they would say, but what did you do? We didn't save lives, but my, we did make people's lives a little bit kinder and gentler while they were in a surreal period in their lives. Was it hard to communicate with people speaking different languages? Finally, and that Google Translate, thank God for that. Everybody has phones, we we'll always pull up mm -hmm. Google Translate. I tried to study Arabic one fall before I went back and failed miserably. Mm -hmm. Like I said, somehow you manage, and enough people spoke enough English that we could get by, and charades, <laughs> and smiles, and hugs, literally. 
in children, children like sponges, so they would pick up the English faster than their parents, and they'd help us out. So somehow, no, that I never felt frustrated because I couldn't communicate. Yes. Were there any social services like therapy for for the refugees? No, no, not really. Different groups would come and go and try to, but when you've got refugees coming in and out, I mean, um, humanitarian aid workers coming in and out all the time, not really. Doctors Without Borders came in and out. In 2020, with the political unrest, a lot of NGOs left the island because it just wasn't, they didn't feel their folks were safe. Um, so there was rudimentary medical care uh, I, not to be judgmental, but it was frustrating for a lot of us Western international volunteers because a lot of babies were born. And there was a fallacy that if you had a baby, then you got to move quicker. Mm -hmm. And that wasn't true. So the hospitals on island, women would have their babies in the hospital, in the middle of the hospital, and then come back to camp. But mental health came not really rudimentary. So yeah, you had really traumatized people that you just had to try to be kind to. Mm -hmm. But it was hard in the clothing shop because we had to say no a lot. No, we don't have brand new clothes for everybody. No, 2018, no, we do not have shoes. Literally, people would follow us, follow us into the grocery stores. They'd follow me to the bathroom. I would have people screaming at me about shoes. I didn't, we didn't have shoes. When that, when that donation finally came through, the way that we went on the ground, three times when Starbucks came to me, because I was usually one of the oldest people, if not the oldest person on the camp. And um, he got to know me, obviously, when I, every time I came back, they welcomed me home. And um, he had come to me to tell me how we were doing things wrong with the distribution because the last thing he wanted was a group of angry, frustrated people trying to get anything. And the shoes were such a problem that summer that every time we tried to distribute shoes, he'd call me aside and say, I don't want it done this way. And I'd have to go to the coordinator and say, I just saw Stavros and she get all, I said. <laughs> But somehow we got everybody the shoes they needed to calm down. So it took a while. How did you have long hours? Oh, we did. We worked six days a week and we worked probably 10, 12 hours a day. What was oh. your housing like? What was their housing like? Your housing. I rented an apartment. The first time I had, the, the first visit I went, Ruben recommended a hotel for me. So I rented, I went to the hotel. The second time I went, I stayed in the um, volunteer apartment. And I was way too old for that stuff. And when I went back, <laughs> when I went back for three months, when I went back for months at a time, I found a realtor, um, a realtor worked with a lot of us to find places. So I lived in apartments by myself. The, where, the record, where our residents lived in Caratepe, um, they were isoboxes. So think about, um, you know those quad storage units that you see in people's yards? They were very similar to that, a little bit bigger. And you would, Afghan people have lots of kids. So you would have sometimes families of 10, 12 people in those small isoboxes. There was a window, there was a door, there was an air conditioning unit that ran for one day in all the months I went. The Greek government was very strict about how much energy we could use in soup. So that's one of the reasons why Jet Vagina, Martin from Holland, with his experience in solar power, he built a couple of solar farms, small solar farms on Karateke, and um, that was enough to power the ice boxes with electricity. So people could, you know, have sunlight and power up their cell phones because that's the only way they were able to still stay in touch with their families that they left behind. What countries did they go 
Township when they closed Cabo Tepe? They went to Moria. Okay. And you are. So a lot, that's a good point. A lot of people <coughs> got very excited when they got the notice that they were leaving Cabo Tepe or the island. thinking they were going to Athens and moving forward. And what I learned from other teammates is that where they were going was sometimes worse than where they were. Again, Karatepe was really, it was really a beautiful place that Stavros worked hard to keep that way. Um, so a lot of times, and back to my two Afghans, they basically illegally made their way to Germany and where they could. One of my, one of my, I got to know a um, young Syrian refugee really well in the spring of 18, because he worked with us almost every day in the kitchens. And he had left Syria with his younger brother <clears throat> and met up with his oldest sister and her family on Karatepe, so they all lived together in one ISO box. Um, Yasser's sister's family got sent by Lesbos before he asked for his younger brother. Um, and then finally in the winter, right before I went back in the winter of 2019, Asser and his younger brother were um, given permission to leave and they went to Athens. And they lived in Athens for about six months. And then he, and he just got frustrated and made his way to um, Holland on their own basically illegally, and just hope that they got there safely. And they did. I saw him last year um, in Athens, in Amsterdam. But, yeah, Mom, you had a question? Yeah, it seemed like a very young population there. Were there any elderly people? They were. Um, one thing I learned, that's when I learned I couldn't tell age anymore, because I saw truly what stress does to people. People I thought were older than me, sometimes 20 years younger than me. But there was um, some elderly people. There was one family that lived next to Sun Kitchen, a bar kitchen, in the spring of 2019 when I was there. So it was an older couple, their grown son and crazy daughter-in-law, and their three children. And the daughter-in-law was pregnant, and they had three little kids under the age of 10. So they all lived in one ice and the dad was in a wheelchair. And there were, that year there seemed to be a lot of people in wheelchairs, children, children who with CP, cerebral palsy, and it's weird how sometimes that went, and I couldn't wrap my mind around how they got a wheelchair on the boats. Wow. Because those boats were made for 10 people, and they, the smugglers would fill them with food. So there were some elderly, um, but I would say the me, the oldest, the average oldest was maybe 50-ish, but mostly young families. Yes? I think you felt more sympathetic to people um, leaving
And on the other side, people did work hard to keep them safe. That's happening in this country. There's a lot of unaccompanied minors coming here because people just have, they have no other choice but to have faith in humanity. Mm -hmm. Somebody will take care of their children. It's hard to wrap the mind around. Yes? Um, you, you mentioned books, a uh, book group or something. I, there are two very good books that I read. <clears throat> One is American Dirt, if people haven't read it. Oh, yeah. American Dirt. And the other was uh, it's just called Refugee by um, Alan Grant, G-R-A-T-T. And, and, and that was an amazing book in that it, it followed like four different countries 